the unsurpassed penetrating and perfect truth is seldom met with, even in a hundred thousand myriad kalpas. Now we can see and hear it. We can remember and accept it. I vow to make the Buddha's truth one with myself. Homage to the Buddha, homage to the Dharma, homage to the Sangha. <coughs> In a few days, we're going to be celebrating our great renewal of vows, during which we'll be reading the scripture of Brahma's net, the Brahma Jala scripture. And we do it over two days because it's a fairly long scripture and it's a wonderful and inspiring work. Those of us who have read it know this well. And especially the first part on the foundations of training is really beautiful, big, vast, and inspiring, profound. It's about the qualities we try to cultivate in our practice. And if you read it, you'll see. And the second part is about the, is the Bodhisattva precepts, or 58 of them, of which the first 10 are the ones that we try to keep in our own tradition. And you can find the scripture in Buddhist writings, and it's on our website for free download under teachings and publications, and it's right at the bottom of the list, so you have to look for it, but it's really good. However, Really, the most important part of these ceremonies is not the reading of the scripture. It's the renewal of our bodhisattva vows. It's called the renewal of vows. And we generally do this renewal of vows twice a month. It's a shorter form of the precepts most times, but in this, this particular time of the year, we do the great renewal of vows. So I thought I'd talk a bit about vows today. Well, for many years I would shy away from making vows. I did not want to take vows. I didn't want to know anything about vows. I thought, if I was going to do something, I'd either do it or not do it. And if I didn't do it, and I'd made a vow about it, well, not only would I not have done it, but I'd also have broken my vow, so why bother? That was my thought. Because I thought of vows as a kind of constricting thing, a sort of thou shalt thing, but it's not like that. And over time, my understanding has changed. When we vow to do something you really want to do, it's joyful. When people get married and they really want to get married, there's joy in this mutual vow of love and support for each other, commitment. But when they don't really want to get married, when they've been pushed into it by other people or by circumstance or whatever, it's not such a joyful thing. It probably feels more like a prison. There's all sorts of movies about people being about to marry the wrong person and then at the last minute, something saves them and they rush off and marry the right person. You think, oh, thank goodness, I kept out of that one. And then, of course, they live happily ever after because it's a movie. I used to have dreams about being about to marry the wrong person, somebody I didn't even know. And I'd wake up and think, oh, thank God, it's just a dream. But anyway. <laughs> but to make vows willingly with a heart that really wants to do it is a joyful thing. To make a wholehearted commitment is the thing. And it's liberating, actually. And it helps to guide our path through life. Like taking the precept, when you really want to do it, we commit ourselves to that. It's joyful. We want to do it, and we say we want to do it. And it's a great blessing. On the other hand, if we're too afraid to commit ourselves to anything, or we haven't found anything we really want to commit ourselves to, it's actually a kind of suffering. We're wandering. Samsara means wandering. We don't have a real direction, something we want to give our life to, give ourselves to. And I know what this is like. I spent years of my youth looking for my purpose, really, wandering. I'd wake again, I'd wake up in the night and think, where am I going? Like my life's going by and I'm not in it. You know, just, it was a suffering. And then I went to Throssel, Throssel Hall Priory as it was then. And right away, this is it, this is my tradition. And I never looked back. And it brought me great joy. Well, obviously not everyone wants to become a monk, as I did, but the, you can all make that commitment of the heart to do what's really good, in whatever way it is. And for us, part of that commitment of the heart is our renewal of vows, as we take the bodhisattva vows, twice a month. And we do it as wholeheartedly and as sincerely as we can. It's a commitment of the heart. And we do it three times just to make sure there's no doubt about it, this is what we're doing. 
And this is what they are, for anyone who doesn't know what our bodhisattva vows are. However innumerable beings may be, I vow to save them all. However inexhaustible the passions may be, I vow to transform them all. However limitless the Dharma may be, I vow to comprehend it completely. However infinite the Buddha's truth is, I vow to realize it. There are differing versions of these four vows, but they all say essentially the same thing. Well, if somebody is at the ceremony and they don't really want to take these vows, I guess you just come for the day, this happens sometimes, or they don't know what the vows are or what they mean, what am I letting myself in for? It's not a problem. They don't have to take them. They can recite them and hope to understand them later, or they can just be quiet. It's not a problem. One of our monks once said that um, if somebody kind of recites the vows, but doesn't, it doesn't, they don't kind of take, it's no problem. They just kind of go by. It's not like they've broken something. It's not a kind of prison that sucks you in and then the door clangs shut behind you and you're stuck with something you don't want to do. It's not like that. It's because it's the intention. It is the intention that makes the vow. It's our aspiration, our deep wish to keep these bodhisattva vows. We can't possibly keep these vows completely, but we can aspire to keep them. We can do our best. They're kind of limitless, open, way bigger than we are. No way could we possibly keep all these vows. However innumerable beings may be, I vow to save them all. <clears throat> you couldn't possibly save all the innumerable beings, or billions of them, our, our, you know, on our own. We couldn't. But we can do our best to help where we can. Just to do our best, to open up to that aspiration. I vow to save all living beings, as best I am able, to do my very best. And we don't go around thinking, I'm going to save this person or that person. That would be kind of arrogant. They may need to save us, you know. But this first vow, saving beings, helping beings, this is the mark of a bodhisattva, the bodhisattva path, the wish, the aspiration to help beings. We're little bodhisattvas. We're not big bodhisattvas like Avalokiteshvara. We're little bodhisattvas in training. We're a little bee. But we're still bodhisattvas, and we aspire to follow the bodhisattva path, taking these vows, and especially this first one, we try to do our best to help beings, whether in big ways or in little mundane ways, just a kindly word, you know. We keep talking about this, trying to practice kindness and unselfishness. <clears throat> and this helps us to do the same. <coughs> Excuse me. But there's no feeling of superiority here. Here I am saving beings. Because we have the second vow to remind us that we're human and imperfect. However inexhaustible the passions may be, I vow to transform them all. No matter who we are, we all have inexhaustible greed, ill will, and ignorance. Inexhaustible. They keep coming up in all sorts of ways. They're never completely done. Maybe when you're an arahant or a Buddha, they're gone. I'm not there yet. And most of us are not there yet. So they keep coming up, our inexhaustible greed, anger, and ignorance, and all the passions, you know. And the more we train ourselves, the more we see them. So sometimes we think we're doing worse than we were before because we hadn't noticed that actually we have all these little critical thoughts in our mind or our little greedy, selfish thoughts. But we can transform them. We don't kill them. We don't try to cut them out of ourselves. We can transform them. We convert them. We convert our greed into generosity and kindness. We convert our ill will into kindness and compassion. We convert our ignorant, ignorance into wisdom. We convert them. We're not getting rid of them. We convert them. <clears throat> and we're also working, on our, for our third vow, we're working on understanding the Dharma. However limitless the Dharma may be, I vow to comprehend it completely. Now this isn't just scholarship. The scholarship does benefit many people. It's very, I mean, you have to have a certain amount of Scholarship. We need to know the basic Buddhist teachings, you know, to make us Buddhist. What are the Four Noble Truths? You may not know what they are and all that. But really, to understand the Dharma completely is putting it into practice. That's how we come to understand it. 
Otherwise, it's just a theoretical thing. I mean, it might just sound good, but we're not practicing it. In order to really understand the Dharma, we have to make it our blood and bones, to put it into practice, like putting the precepts into practice, making it the, our very blood and bones. The Dharma is limitless, however limitless the Dharma may be. Sometimes people feel they really understand the Buddha's teaching. Oh yes, I know what it's about, you know, I can help people, I've got a certain amount of wisdom. Or that it's kind of simple. In some ways it's just simple, but it's huge also. I think it's much deeper and bigger than we can imagine. The Buddha said, you'd have a handful of leaves in a forest, and he said, what I've taught you is just like this little handful of leaves compared with all the leaves in the forest. There's a whole lot more that I've not told you anything about. So, the Dharma is limitless, far beyond our understanding, our little understanding. I think it's always good to bear that in mind and not to think we've got it down, you know, we know it all. Otherwise we're just limiting ourselves. We're limiting the Dharma. We're making a little small thing that makes, you know, it's comfortable. I put it in the closet and keep it as a little bit of my life I take out on Sundays, you know. It's much bigger than we are. And to always bear that in mind, to open ourselves up to that enormity, enormity of the Buddha Dharma. It keeps us humble and thinking, not thinking, oh, I know something, I got, you know, we don't really know much of anything. And as they say, the more we go on, the less we know, and that's just as well. The Dharma is not always comfortable, but it is our true refuge. We can't make it some little small comfortable size that we just take out and control. You really, we're not in control of much of anything. Our fourth vow, however infinite the Buddha's truth is, I vow to realize it. This is even bigger, you know, and this is our focus. However in infinite the Buddha's truth is, I vow to realize it. It's our basic focus, but it's not a narrow focus. It's not me wanting something, wanting to get something, wanting to have the Buddha's truth. Because we have the first vow also to help all beings. It's not just about me trying to get wisdom for myself. There's some type, you know, sometimes people think that, but no. It's because we're trying to help everybody, not just ourselves. We do try to help ourselves. We also try to help all beings because we're all connected. We aspire to deep wisdom and to great compassion. They have to have work together. You can't have one without the other. But to vow to realize the Buddha's infinite truth helps to keep us focused on our path, helps us to renew our aspiration for the way. It's really helpful to say this and to remember, yes, I vow to realize the Buddha's truth. I may think I'm not very good at this, I may think I don't have much wisdom, but I vow to do it anyway, because that really helps us. And it reminds us that we do have that capacity to realize the truth, to understand the Dharma, to transform our imperfections and our passions, and to help beings. We may not do it perfectly, we're never going to do it completely, but we can aspire to that. We open ourselves up to these enormous, huge, vows. So all these four vows work together and they actually encapsulate what we're trying to do in our practice when you think about it. To practice kindness and compassion and help all beings, yes. To convert our greed, anger and ignorance. Compassion, generosity, love and wisdom instead. To transform them into that, yes. To understand the Buddha's teaching and to realize the truth for ourselves, yes and yes. To do all these things, that's our practice, that's what we do. Everything is contained within that. Well, as I said, these vows are not a kind of prison that we're stuck in. We don't need to be afraid of taking these vows, afraid of making that commitment, because we just give ourselves to them. We give ourselves to our aspiration, do our very best to help ourselves, to help other beings, to keep the vows as best we can knowing that we're not perfect and we're not going to do it perfectly. Because we want to keep these vows. We want to help beings. We want to convert our suffering and not stop creating more. We want to realize the truth and understand the, the teachings. And we know we're not going to keep them perfectly. Sometimes we're greedy, we're selfish, we're angry, we're deluded, we're confused, we're distracted, we're lazy. You know, these things come all our way. We're not perfectly awakened and gung-ho every minute of the day. No, we're not always awake and present and focused on our 
ultimate goal, no. Our deepest wish of the heart, but we're doing our best. And making these vows helps us to do that, to do our best, knowing that we're human and we will not keep them perfectly. But it's a real help. It's like a, something that we aspire to, to take these vows and to aspire to keep them. Now, as if this weren't enough, as if it were not enough, there is a deep vow in the Avatam Saka scripture, which I dearly love. I mentioned it before, here it is again. As long as space exists, as long as beings exist, as long as, as long as karma and suffering exist, so long shall my vow remain. Love it, love it. This is the, like the body, the, this, my vow, the Bodhisattva vow, the vow to help all beings. And it also includes all the other vows we just talked about. All of those vows, the vow, the Bodhisattva vow. As long as space exists, as long as beings exist, as long as karma and suffering exist, so long shall my vow remain. This vow goes beyond our little life and death. Of course, we're just a little brief being. You know, our life is very short. We keep, recently we've had a lot of people die. We've seen life is really transient. People die very quickly sometimes, sometimes over a long time. But our little life and death, in the grand scheme of things, is like a little candle flickering. But the vow remains. So long shall my vow remain. Well, it's not really my vow. It's just the vow. This vow goes beyond our own little life, our own little death, our own little aspiration. But we add our aspiration. We take this vow, we make these vows, and no one's requiring us to do it. But there's joy in that. There's joy of our aspiration for the way and making that aspiration and not letting fear of commitment hold us back. Just, this is what I want to do. This is my aspiration. This is what I wish. And it's much bigger than me much bigger than my life, much bigger than my death. It's like we drop a pebble, a pebble into a pool and the ripples go on for a long, long time. Maybe forever, we don't know. We simply entrust ourselves to our vow. We cast ourselves out into that which supports us, which is beyond our understanding, in faith, because it's faith that is the basis of it all. Knowing that we can't keep these vows perfectly, but we have that deep wish of the heart to do our very best, to help beings, help ourselves, to realize the truth, to practice truth, to live by the Buddha's teaching, to con convert our greed, anger, and ignorance, and so on. That's our great wish, and it's faith that supports that aspiration. Our wish to train ourselves and to help all beings. We couldn't possibly do it all by ourselves. We just do our best, casting ourselves out into that great matter that helps and supports us as we do our training. Faith that keeps us going in darkness and in light. And our vows nourish that faith and our aspiration for the way. That's our talk for the day. Thank you.